Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and it's a pleasure and privilege to be back here again to kind of discuss about cerebral palsy and anesthesia. And I'd especially like to thank Mr. Mitro for asking me to come over. And as per his advice, this entire deliberation will be kind of pitched at the general population. So you'll not find a lot of medical jargon, but try and emphasize and figure out whether or not you can provide anesthesia in a patient with cerebral palsy and how we can make it safe. Uh, we know, we have figured it out, that what is affected in cerebral palsy, the brain, and to a certain extent because of the affection onto the motor end plate, the neuromuscular junction. And when you ask the question, where do these anesthetics act, we'll figure out that the ones that are needed to keep the patient asleep, or to put them to, us, uh, 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 to sleep and to elevate the pain, they would act on the brain. And to prevent them from moving when a certain procedure is happening, those drugs act on the motor end plate. So that is why people tend to think that since these agents would act at those very places where the disease actually works, do anesthetics actually make cerebral palsy worse? And can we lead to a scenario that this child gets worser when you administer anesthetics to them? So when we discuss about anesthesia and cerebral palsy, we will try and answer a few questions. First thing is, can we provide anesthetics? Is it safe? What are the risks in this group of individuals compared to the normal population? How does the disease affect an anesthetic? Can this get worse, as we were discussing? And does anesthesia technique and ag uh, the agents and the technique that we use possibly harm the patient even more? And I think the bottom line is, when we actually need, and we would need to deliver anesthetics to these patients, how do we make this safer to those people? So, is it safe? I think Pete Seeger would have told you that we shall overcome whatever be the challenges. And this man would say, yes, we can. So in a, in a nutshell, I would say that yes, if you need to deliver anesthetics to a person with cerebral palsy, you can. When would they need an anesthetic? And I think this has been discussed, that if you need to do imaging, and that is very common in this group of patients, that they would need an anesthetic because they don't usually lie quiet while an imaging is happening. You might need certain specific procedures where you need to take out the spasticity, the immobility, like radiofrequency ablation of the dorsal root, where an anesthetics is needed. Most common areas where anesthetic is needed for this group of individuals would be orthopedic procedures. Tendon transfer, fusioning, lengthening of the uh, joints so that they have a much better functional ability while they live. VP shans, endoscopy, again, these are uh, procedures where they would need to be put to sleep and even a general anesthetic at times. Squint correction, grommet insertion, cochlear implants, more commonly done in this group of individuals, again, you would need sedatives, analgesics, anesthetics. So when they need anesthetics, does the disease process affect how we ch uh, handle these uh, patients with cerebral palsy? The first thing, and that in, in fact is the benchmark of anesthetic care for a person with cerebral palsy, is the challenge to establish some kind of a communication with the patient. Does the person feel comfortable with you? And this obviously involves not only the child, but also the parent, so that you establish a form of communication which is difficult compared to the normal population. And the easier you do it, the better you do it, I think that uh, kind of becomes the hallmark of whether or not you are doing a good job with your anesthetics in this group of individuals. Does it bother us? Yes, it does. Because they are unique, 
They're different from the general population. They have a lot of comorbidity, which has been alluded to by my previous speakers. And if when we grade individuals as to the anesthesia risk, you would be, most of you would be kind of aware that we have a grading system called the ASA physical status, which is from uh, rolls from one to five. And most of the cerebral palsy patients would kind of be categorized to group three. So yes, compared to a normal population, they are more at risk. Problems, they have problems with their hydration status, renal functions, lot of drugs, so and that can influence an anesthetic, and they have a little bit of impaired cardiorespiratory function, which needs to be taken care of. Respiratory, they're very common to aspiration pneumonia. They have lung scarring, and this would be how the chest X-rays look like. They could have uh, restrictive diseases of the lung, like scoliosis, which can make uh, a general anesthetic more challenging. And they can, this long-term uh, pulmonary disease can lead to uh, states of core pulmonale, which also can make anesthesia far more challenging than in the general population. If you look at the GI system, they have difficulty in eating, swallowing, and they're drooling. They can be malnourished. They could be anemic, leading to dehydration. Very common, they have gastroesophageal reflux. Riles tube feeding is common, and all these can lead to increased risks while they are being put to sleep and you're being mechanically ventilated. This is something that I think bothers anesthetics the more, is how we take control on the airway. Will we be able to put in a tube through the person's throat? Will you be able to take control on the breathing? They have poor uh, dentition, they are spastic, the problems with the temporomandibular joints, so mouth opening and intubation becomes real problematic with this. And we need to be aware while we are taking care of patients with cerebral palsy. Then they have problems with their musculoskeletal system, positioning them on an operating room, and surgeons would agree with me, that becomes problematic. They have problems finding access to their intra for intravenous access. Their muscles are contracted, so when you cut through them, they bleed far more than their normal muscles, so we need to be aware that they can lose blood, and do we have blood ready to counteract that increased blood loss? They are receiving more often than not a host of drugs. And more, quite of these drugs, quite often, can interact with the anesthetics. And again, it is the awareness of this that is important while you take care of them in the operating room, or in the intervention suit, or in the radiology suit, or in the endoscopy rooms. The challenge, therefore, is when they need an anesthetic, you cannot be denying them an anesthetic. That's possibly not ethical. So what we need to do is we have to make the anesthetic tailored to this group of individuals and keep it as safe as possible. So you do a few preoperative investigations, and if you can, try and optimize those. And the one thing that you can possibly optimize is their respiratory function, is by improving their hydration status, by nebulizing them, by doing chest physiotherapy so that retained secretions are brought out and their lungs are in a much more optimized situation. Antibiotics to be continued, drugs like anticonvulsants should necessarily be continued, and uh, for intraoperative management, I think it is ultimately nearly the same, only that we'll have to tweak it here and there so you need to know that your max that you're trying to attend would be a little lower for them. You do standard monitoring, but you'd possibly definitely do temperature monitoring and neuromuscular junction monitoring. Post-operative management, usually is the standard routine care, but where do you take care of them? Unlike the normal population, you'll definitely take care of them in a high dependency unit. And why in a high dependency unit? Again, because they're more prone to hemodynamic changes. They're more prone to getting uh, desaturated. They're more prone to getting hypotensive. And they're more prone to becoming hypothermic. And the only way you can pick them up is if you monitor them uh, adequately. This is, again, something that they're quite commonly happens is they lead to atelectasis and aspiration, and again, this can be picked up if you are monitoring them more closely. Pain management, it is actually a bugbear, and you need to be aware that they will not be able to tell you that they are in pain. So you'll have to pick up very simple points, 
which can tell you that this person possibly needs greater pain management. And therefore, the easiest way or the best way possibly to do it would be to have a continuous uh, IV infusion or a continuous technique of pain management instead of giving intermittent boluses. Uh, regional anesthetics play a big uh, role in the post-operative pain management because that uh, kind of takes away the narcotics which can also work on the brain. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and paracetamol also has a big role to play in the post-operative pain management of this group of patients. So, to answer this, can we provide anesthetic? Is it safe? I think I've answered this. That's yes, it can be provided. It has to be made safe, is that is what is the thing. What are the risks? There are risks, but we need to take care and go ahead and be aware and take care of the patient. Can anesthetics make the disease worse? I think it's an emphatic no. And how can we be safer is by being aware that these are the uh, challenges that are there and these are the few things that I need to do extra. So I would conclude by saying, uh, uttering the words of Meher Baba and singing to the tune of Bobby McFrain is that you don't worry, be happy, but please play it safe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a patient hearing.